Hi, so we're looking at working in Teams unit today, but learning outcome three. Now, learning outcome three is understand theories of motivation. So there are three criteria for him. 3.1 is describe different theories of motivation. 3.2 is with reference to leadership theory, identify those factors which are generally considered to demotivate and motivate people in the workplace. And then 3M1 follows on from 3.2, which is assess your own personal motivating and demotivating factors. So let's make a start. So for 3.1, describe different theories of motivation. We're just going to look at a few um, motivation theories here. So the first one is Hertzberg's two theory factor. Hi. Hi, Victoria. How are you? Hi, I'm fine. Thank you. How are you? I'm good as well. So I've just literally started on my first slide for uh, 3.1. So I'll carry on with that and then obviously just ask me questions as you come through. Okay. Brilliant. So we're just looking at different theories of motivation. So we're going to look at a few of these um, theories. The first one is Hertzberg's two-factor theory. Now this uh, two-factor theory of motivation is also known as the dual factor theory or the motivation hygiene theory and it was developed by a guy called uh, Frederick Herzberg and he was a psychologist in the 1950s and he looked at the responses of 200 accountants and engineers and they were asked about their positive and negative feelings about their work so he looked at all of the um, feedback that they gave and he found that there were two factors that influence employee motivation and uh, satisfaction. So the first one is motivating factors. So these are just factors that, you know, help you to lead to um, satisfaction and how your mo um, employees will work harder, how they're motivated, you know, is things like how you might enjoy your work or if you're feeling recognized or if you're getting career progression out of it. So that will help you to um, be motivated. And then you've got your hygiene factors, and these factors can actually lead to dissatisfaction and lack of motivation if they're not met. So things are like your salary, your company policies, what benefits you're getting, what sort of relationship you've actually got with the people that you work with, so management and your co-workers. So you might not have the greatest relationship with them, so that will demotivate you. Now, According to Herzberg, when he found these, he believes that the motivator and the fa hygiene factors are influenced by motivation and they work completely independently of each other. So they're not dependent. You have to feel one way to um, feel the other. It, they're completely standalone. So what he says was that motivating factors did increase employee satisfaction and motivation. But then um, even if you didn't have these factors in place, it doesn't mean that you're going to be dissatisfied. And it's the same thing for hygiene factors, that they don't really increase your satisfaction or motivation. But then if you don't even have those particular things, they're not going to increase your dissatisfaction either. So how does it actually happen in the workplace? So we've got a bit of information on here. So this theory, it just says that even for the happiest and most productive workforce, you need to work on improving your motivator and your hygiene factors. So to help motivate your own employees, you need to make sure that they feel appreciated, that they're supported, that you give them feedback, and then they'll want to grow and progress within your company and stay within the job as well. And also to prevent job dissatisfaction, oh, I can't say that word, dissatisfaction. <laughs> you've got to make sure that you're treating them right. You know, you've got good working conditions, you've got fair pay, that you're not having issues with, uh, you know, cold drafts running in or underpaid or them feeling that they're doing too much but not getting um, given the credit for it. 
So there's lots of things that you've got to do to try and um, make sure that they're not dissatisfied. Are you okay with the Hertzberg uh, one, Vicky? Yeah. I'm good, thank you. Brilliant. Let's go on to the next one. Then you've got Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Now, with the Maslow's hierarchy of needs, this actually applies to anywhere that you're in. So schools, work, home, any of these things. And you might have heard about it in school. I know that is something that's come quite big and a lot of schools do uh, talk about meeting students' needs through this hierarchy. But it's not a problem if you haven't. So with Maslow's hierarchy of needs, he's a this is a psychologist called Abraham Maslow. And in 1943, he created a paper called A Theory of Human Motivation. <laughs> and on this, he says that you have five you've got basic and then there's five levels on these needs you've got your physical need this needs to be met for a person to survive like food water shelter you've got your safety so this is like your personal and your financial security your health and well-being your love and belonging needs that is for you to have friendships and relationships your family you know have a good friendship at work You've got your esteem needs, and that is for you to actually feel confident in yourself and for you to feel respected by others. And then you've got your self-actualization needs, where you've got the desire to achieve anything that you can do or anything that you want to do. You just want to go ahead and do it. So according to Maslow, of his hierarchy of needs, it says that you need to have good health, be safe and secure, have meaning relationship, meaningful relationships, be confident, and then just be the best that you can be, whatever you've got a desire to do to try and go and fulfill it. Now, for work, you can actually apply it to work in a lot of places as well. So if we go back to your need for being in a safe, secure place, if I go back onto here, for physiological need, you are in work, you're going to have your break times at work. So you've gone into work today, you'll have a break time, you'll have access to water, you'll be sitting in a nice, warm, comfortable place. For safety, you're getting paid, you've got that financial security there. Health and well-being is where, you know, you're feeling well in yourself. Love and belonging. So when you're at work, you're going to have certain friendships with certain people. You're going to be comfortable talking to them and you'll be happy going in if they're in that day. Your esteem, you know, if you're going into work and you're not feeling respected and you feel that somebody's looking down on you, you're not going to enjoy that job. And then self-actualization is where you've gone in and you have a desire to actually do more. But you might want to go and do another um, course or you might want to work towards getting promoted or you might want to be saying, I want to be employee of the month. So it's what you feel in yourself. So are you OK with the, um, the Maslow's theory? Yeah. I quite like this one because it can be applied to like daily life, regardless yeah. of what situation you're in. Not just business. Yeah. Not life. Exactly. Yeah. Let's go on to the next one. Then you've got your Hawthorne effect. Now, the Hawthorne effect is um, described by somebody called Henry A. Landsberg in 1950. And he noticed a tendency for some people to work harder and perform better when they were being re observed by researchers. And I, I, I'll have a little bit of a laugh at this because it's true. When you know that you're getting uh, observed by, say, if you're at work and you know your boss walks by and you'll start working a little bit better you'll be more professional won't you you're not going to continue with yeah. your gossip and jokes yeah even, even if they don't look at you but their presence already yeah on, on the edge <laughs> Exactly. And then when I, I remember when I used to have teaching observations and there'd be bits where I would do, I'd, I'd work perfectly fine anyway, but you know, you end up chatting or having a bit of a gossip. But as soon as that manager or that head of year came in, you'd be like, right, everybody, what are we doing? You'd just oh get a little God. bit more active, wouldn't you? Yeah. And you know what? 
when I was a student and another like um someone else would come in the class, the teacher would change nine percent yeah. and it was like, Oh my god, you know to say, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> You're like, you're not that nice it's to us, us, are you? <laughs> or then when one of your teachers that isn't the uh, nicest starts saying, oh, of course, sweetheart, I'll help you yeah. with that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, my God. I mean, you can take yeah. advantage of it. But, see, it's also an effect. It's, it's even without knowing what the purpose of it, you know that this is what, it, it, things like this just happen. Yeah. So, what they did was the Hawthorne effect is actually named after a series of social experiments where they looked at um, influencing physical conditions on productivity. So they looked at a, a Western electric factory in Hawthorne, so in Chicago, in that city, it was called Hawthorne. And they did this in the 1920s and 30s. So what the researchers that went in, they changed a few physical conditions over the um, course of this experiment. So they changed the lighting, the working hours, the breaks. But on in all of the cases, employee productivity was increased when a change was made. So what those researchers decided in the end is that these employees became motivated to work harder because attention was being paid to them rather than the physical change. So if they had just been left alone with those physical changes, if they had low lighting or too bright lighting, it might have affected them. But even if it was affecting them, they're not going to say anything because they've got people watching them and they don't want to, you know, feel like they're mm. um, being fussy or anything or yeah. stand out even. So how can this Hawthorne effect be uh, applied into a workplace? So these studies, as it says, if you're being watched, you f your employees are going to work harder. So observations and things um, do take place because of this. But even though you can observe your employees when you're walking backwards and having a bit of an eye out, it's not recommended that you watch them all day or that you're always trying to give them feedback, or you're always trying to see how they're doing. Because it's going to um, be too difficult for you to do and for them to keep it up as well. So you've got to just show your employees that you care about them and their working conditions. And when you're doing that in a normal daily basis, listening to them, getting their feedback, if one is saying that this flickering light is really... Um, there's a light that needs bulb that needs changing. It's flickering and it's really hurting my eyes. You go and get that changed. It's going to make them, you know, feel happy and um, like they're being listened to at work. Yeah. Then you've got your expectancy theory. So your expectancy theory, it just proposes that people would choose how they're going to behave depending on the outcomes of an expected behavior. So you will actually might notice this, and I know I, I come up with school environment a lot, is because I've got more, quite a lot of experience in there. But when you come in, you're going to class and you've got a particular student that acts in a certain way, or you know, oh, this is the class clown, they're going to mess about, or um, this is the person that's always uh, being and will answer everything. Because you're expected to behave a certain way, you'll actually try and fulfill that weren't you yeah <coughs> excuse me <coughs> oh that came on suddenly mm -hmm. so this expectancy, oh, expectancy theory it just suggests that the process that we decide our behaviors is influenced by how we think what our rewards will be. So if the person that's been the class clown or the joker is uh, thinking what's their reward, it's going to be all the other kids laughing at, laughing with them and thinking that they're being really cool. They're going to want to play up to it. And it's the same at work. So if you think you're expecting to work harder, I'm going to work really hard and I'm going to get a pay rise. They promised me I'll get a pay rise if I meet all my targets. So that's what you're working towards because you're expecting something out of it. Yeah. So the expectancy theory has three elements. So you've got expectancy where you're believing that your effort will re result in your desired goal. Your instrumentality where you believe that you're going to receive a reward if you meet your 
uh, uh, targets or your performance expectations or your goals. And then the valence. So the value that you actually place on the reward. So if you're not really bothered about being uh, promoted or you know, getting that extra hour off at lunch or being able to finish early, it's not going to, you're not really going to change your behavior. But if you really are striving to get higher and higher in the company because you want to do that for your career, then you're going to work a lot harder. So it's yeah. depending on. Yeah. I want to get to university, so I really want to do my assignments good. Exactly. And it's like, you know, that once you finish this course, you can go in, you can put your UCAS points yeah. in and say, I've got my uh, level three in here. I'm going to get my, is it 24, 40, I think it's 45 points or something out of it. So um, depending on what they think, I've been, I've been doing some studying on UCAS points. <laughs> so <laughs> I thought it's a good idea to know what they are. <laughs> so, oh, you know, because they do different, um, UK University, this one, they do different courses, right? I wanted to do social um, care. The and health and social care one is 60 credits. So because yeah. you needed, um, was it 120 credit course? Yeah, that's why. Yeah. So you would have had to do the, um, you would have to do a couple of courses um, to get to that. So this is the best way for you to get your points yeah. out of it. It makes sense. I mean, it's but a little bit longer. I mean, with the um, health and social care, the the one that we've just phased out because we're getting a new one. We've just um starting a new one now. That's six units, but the original one was only four units, so it was quicker to come through. But then you're still lacking. You would have had to go on would go have on to, to another. another one, so it would have been more yeah. anyway, if you put them together. And yeah. it would have been more expensive, and it would have been so much more headache for you as well. No one wants it. I think I'm gonna do business at <laughs> But I think the whole point is once you're getting, it's for you to get your points, um, have yeah, enough clearing it, yeah. so you can get into yeah. Yeah, that is it. Have you decided on which course you're going to do now? So I spoke to the person that hmm. put me to to this, and so I wanted so uh sociology or psychology the most, right? Yes. Well, she's telling me that um, she was, she's thinking, she asked me if I, if I would mind to do social social care, mm-hmm. health and social care. And then I was a little bit like, mm, I know I would be more interested in sociology, but I yeah. know I, where I want to get in life, in general, my goals, it does fit with health and social care, first of all. Second of all, I would actually get a job after the degree because people actually need people with degrees of social health and social care yeah that's true it's quite um, a big open market at the moment yeah right so if i'm gonna you know get a student loan and stuff i'll have to pay back um all the time so i might as well get a degree that would actually pay off and that makes sense i think so i think i'm gonna do health and social care yeah go for the one that you're comfortable because remember you're going to have to do it for three years and you need to have uh, some sort of passion towards it so even with health and social care like you want to help young uh young uh, yeah young people you still can go into that field later on as well so it's still that possibility is still open for you yeah and regarding yeah. the uh the student finance the student loan i mean the good thing about that is you've got to be earning i think over 25 or twenty seven thousand before you start paying it back ever. And it's yeah. low interest rate, so it it does um, give you that peace of mind, doesn't it? That you don't have to rush. Yeah, yeah. And I will be getting like a thousand pound a month when I'll be going to uni. Yeah. yeah, and you might even get some sort of bursaries or scholarships or uh, assistance as well. So there's lots of things that you can apply for uh, with it. Just keep your keep an eye out and ask about those. Yeah, yeah. I would do. I'm excited though. I'm really, really excited. Do you know what? I'm excited for you. You're gonna be. Uh, it's gonna be fantastic. I know. I just wanna get done with this and then carry on because the another start date is January, so I have mm-hmm. to finish my day. So you need to it get it uh, submitted by October something, isn't it? Nineteenth of October or something like that. Oh my God! What is now? It's September, isn't it? 
Yeah, I know because I, I um, like I said, I was doing a bit of UCAS points studying yesterday. Just to, I had a few minutes, so I phoned them and I was like, oh, when's the next submission? And I think it's, um, you've got to accept a place by October. But do you know what? I phoned them and asked them, um, it's, get it confirmed. So if I don't do it by October, yeah, I think they've got a because uh, they've got a cut off dates for when they're having the next submission. So it'll be. It, don't quote me on this. I could be wrong. I might have got the wrong information. Yeah, and it might be, look, yeah, different for different courses. But because you've got to apply to start in January, you've got to apply early, don't you? Probably yeah. Yeah. So give you cast a call. Call them today. <laughs> Just double check it. Oh my god, okay. I yeah. only have. No, I still have like four, isn't it? <laughs> it's not only. No, it might mean just you working, uh, putting a few more hours into your assignments, but to be honest, it's doable. It, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Because your certificate doesn't take long to come out, and then you can always um, get uh, paperwork from us to show that we've submitted for it, and this is what your result is out of it. Okay. Yeah. Print. And that's so February. February. Yeah. February. Yeah. Just just okay. give them a call today. Put uh, the uh, UCAS inquiry number, and um, they they'll let you know exactly what their deadlines and things are. Because it's good to know for you too, especially if you're working towards doing a January yeah. or February intake. Yeah. Yeah. Brilliant. So back on to here. So how can you apply this to the workplace? So all it is is you're going to set achievable goals for your employees. You're not going to say to them, right, I want you to sell or uh, construct 600 uh, engine parts uh, by the end of the day. It's not going to happen. So make sure it's achievable. And that, you know, the rewards that you're giving to your employees are actually ones that they want. So if you were to come and offer me a bottle of wine, if I was to meet any targets that I might have, I would, I don't want to, I don't drink. It's not something that I would do. But for somebody else, they might be like, oh, yeah, I'm going to work towards going for that bottle of wine because I want it. You know, so you've got to look at who your employee is and what um, sort of rewards will actually work for them. Then you've got your three-dimensional theory of attribution. So your attribution theory, it just explains how we attach meaning to our own and other people's behavior. And there's quite a few theories about this. You've got Bernard Weiner's three-dimensional theory, where it says that people try to determine what we do and why we do it. So according to Wiener, the reasons are for this is because we're going to attribute our own behavior and how it can influence how we can behave, how it can influence our behavior or our futures, to be honest. Like now, you know, with this, if you're going to complete these assignments, you're going to be able to apply for university. Once you've applied for university, you'll do your degree. And after that, you'll get a very good high paying job. And you can literally do anything because you're going to have that degree under your belt. So that's what's driving you uh, towards your goals on here. So it's your sort yeah. of motivating yourself. Yeah. And also on stability, so how stable is this attribution? So, for example, if a student believes that they failed the exams because they weren't smart enough, this is a stable factor. So an unstable factor is something that's less permanent. So they would say that I failed my exams because I was feeling really ill that day. So if a student says, I failed my exams, I wasn't smart enough, or I didn't revise enough, they can fix that and they can go back and they can try and, um, you know, resit those exams. So for Wiener, what he says is that staple attributions for successful achievements, like passing exams, can lead to positive expectations. So you're getting higher motivation. And then you've got something called locus of central. Now, this is um, caused by an event which is internal or external. So is this something that happened because it was internally or was it an external factor that stopped you from doing these things? So an example of this is if a student believes it's their own fault that they failed the exam, is because they might say, oh, I'm not smart enough. You know, that's an in internal cause. 
but if they if believed it was an external factor, like, oh, it was poor teaching, I didn't get enough experience, they didn't get enough motivation, then that is an external factor. So internal is something that you're putting on yourself in a way, and external is something you're putting on someone else. And then you get controllability on here. So how controllable was the situation? So do they believe that they could have performed better if they'd revised, if they'd been more motivated? Do they think they can go back and do it and try and get rid of all these factors that were against them in the start off and then go in with the clear head? So how control, how much can they control it? So how do you apply this to the workplace? This is the last bit for 3.1. So for Wiener's three-dimensional theory, um, it says that you should give employee feedback. So if you're giving your employee specific feedback and letting them know what they can improve and how they can do it, this will actually help them to go ahead and say, right, this is a mistake I made before, or this is what I wasn't doing quite right. I'm going to try and work the way that Vicky has taught me to do. So I'm going to go and do what she said. Let's see if that makes a difference. And then also you can praise your employees when they're showing those improvements, when they've taken that feedback that you've given to them and they're saying, oh, yeah, this I'm actually working towards what she said to me, you can say, well, then I can see an improvement in your work. Your time manageability is getting better. You're, um, you know, doing uh, tasks more efficiently and you're doing this skill that I asked you to do in the way I did. So, well, well done. You're using the correct method to do this. So, encourage them and um you know give them that praise cuz it really does yeah. help so are you okay with 3.1 on all these different theories of motivation yeah yeah so 3.2 with the reference to leadership theories so to the leadership theory identify those factors which are generally considered to demotivate and motivate people in the workplace so we're just going to look at factors that will um, help you be motivated and factors that will help you not be motivated so there are a few factors that will demotivate people is if you're doing micromanagement so micromanagers, they do have, <laughs> they have the good thoughts and intentions and they think, oh, okay, I'm just going to go in and I'm going to try and get this done. But to be honest, a micromanager, somebody who's always there hovering over you or taking over your tasks, they can drive you crazy. They can sap the life out of you. They're going to give you such a bad headache when you're at work because you're going to like, oh my god they're back again you know just <laughs> you're wasting my time let me just get on with what you're doing <laughs> because if I was to come on uh, and to be honest this is what I used to do when I used to work one-to-one -one with uh, a particular child very early in my career I'd be telling him oh, okay come on let's do this and as soon as I saw that he wasn't doing I'd, I'd grab his pencil off him and I'll start taking over and I'm like no I like this and this and it took me quite a while to realize what I was doing I mean he he wasn't bothered he was quite a young child so he was happy that I was doing his work for him but it's like you might have a young cousin and you'll give them at Christmas time you might say oh let's make decorations or paper chains and they're sitting there and they're trying to cut out strips of paper but you take over because they're too slow or they're not cutting it straight or they're not oh. gluing them properly that you type of thing Hi. Yeah. Or used to call me, or they used to be like, Oh, she's talented but she's lazy. Uh. And I've heard that my whole life. Do you know what? I don't think you're lazy at all. I think that everybody takes a little time to process things and then you need to just let them what a lot of adults don't realise is that You've spoken to someone, especially a young child, you've given them a set of instructions, you've gone blah 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 blah. They need a second to be able to actually understand what you said. So if they're quiet, if they're sitting there for a couple of minutes just trying to process what you're doing, let them do it. And then after a few minutes, go and ask, are you okay? Do you need me to explain it again? Yeah. But that's where a lot of people lack off and they don't really... And it kind of kills your confidence, you know what I mean? It does, doesn't it? Especially if you're getting someone saying, oh, she's lazy, she doesn't do this. It's not. And I heard it for so long, so then I started believing it. It does, because you think that this is my expectation, this is what they're saying out of me, why do I even bother? 
Yeah. But now I'm kind of... But no, see, your quality... Okay, it makes sense. Yeah. No, seriously, I'm telling you one thing. You are not lazy. You get your tasks done in time. You do everything you need to do. You show up for every single lesson. So don't ever believe it if anyone says that. Just just say, give me a second. Let me just process what you've told me. I'll get started in a minute. Yeah, definitely. So onwards, another uh, demotivating factor is lack of progress. So is it if you don't actually feel like you're progressing, so sometimes a lot of people do work for their salaries, but then a lot of them like to be paid a certain amount, but they actually feel that their work matters as well. So if you're in a company for a while and you're in the same position all the time and you know you've got the progression to go forward and then it's just nothing is being done for you and you feel like oh what's what's the point i'm not progressing anywhere i'm just i'm, I'm just going to carry on doing the same role for the next 10 odd years there's there's no point in me even trying anymore so it demotivates you you stop being such a uh you know get goer don't you and you just sort of like only do your daily perform tasks yeah Job insecurity. So, you know, if you're not 100% sure what's going on, you know, you're like, oh, this, this, um, we might get sacked, we might do other things. I remember working for, uh, I've worked in a lot of places in my day. So <laughs> I remember working for British Gas. And at that time, um, what they were going to do was um, take over all of their um, back business people so we were the ones that were doing all the accounts putting me to reads and all you know the basic stuff for managing accounts taking all a management side um off to a different country they were outsourcing it to a different country so at that time we were told oh yeah we're going to be outsourcing it you won't have any jobs and uh, we might have to give you all redundancy we're not sure when this is gonna happen it could be in three months but it could be a year so you start worrying, you're thinking, I'm not secure in my job. I need to start planning. I need to start going and finding a, a job elsewhere. So, or what's my next move going to be? So that can demotivate you as well, because you think I've worked here for so long. I'd only been there for a year, but somebody that had been there for like five, six years would think I've worked here for so long. I've spent so much time in here and now uh, I've got nothing to show for it. Yeah. Then you've got no confidence in your company leadership. So, you know, if you've got good leaders, good managers, you're going to be happy. You're going to have, if they've got that open door policy where you can go in and speak to them comfortably, then you know you're happy at your work. But if you don't have that, if you know that you're, or you're unfortunately, in a lot of places, it happens that the management is just in is just happy about themselves. They're not really that focused on their workers. Oh, if that's the case. I work yeah. with one. Uh huh. I do, I don't think I've told you. When mm -hmm. he said to me, he was teaching me. It was an apprenticeship, and um, I was um some administrator, some business. And he taught me. He said when people come, right, that work for him. Mm -hmm. He said when people come in the office, don't turn around for at least a couple of minutes to make sure that they know that you own this office. Oh. He said, don't turn around and talk to them for a little bit. Like, let them be there. In other words, ignore them for a couple of minutes and then turn. Yeah, because you basically have more power than they do. Because they were they were carers that we were working in the office. He was um, owning a care in some... Um, that is caring just business or whatever. ridiculous, yeah. isn't it? I know, you can pull me that. What are you talking about? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you know, I would never. I get so excited when I see people. I want to say hello. That's the case I know. And he used to do that. Oh, really? it's after that. People will come in, he will ignore it. Like, I'm gobsmacked by that sofa. because the, the first thing is, especially when you're at the front of the business, is to make sure that you acknowledge your customers or whoever they are that's coming in. Because that's they're going yeah, to want to come working. back again, aren't they? Oh my goodness! And then he said, because most of his care workers were African, he mm -hmm. was African himself, right? He yeah. he came to England like ten years ago, <clears throat> so he read some book written from a white man's perspective, but he said the slavery was 
African people's fault and that we cho- that we don't fight back. That's she ridiculous. said that to yeah. his own workers. And I was thinking, oh, my God, I had to go. <laughs> I had to go. Oh, no, 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 no. no way. Oh, my God, it was scary. That, um, <laughs> if that guy's still in that job, I'd be really surprised. <laughs> he is. That's the problem. He really is. I think the issue is that it's that uh, thing where, you know, when someone's coming to watch you, you're going to be- change your behavior completely. And then when you're on your own, you just is that power trip that he was on, apparently, where he's deciding that or oh, made these conclusions that I've got more power than everyone. Or, I, uh, to be honest, I'm glad you left because I wouldn't like working for someone like that. I know. And he was a pr- like, he was sexually harassing me. Hmm. So, yeah, he made some very sexist joke to me in front of the whole office. And, just, yeah, it, it was, he was just out of order. He felt like he can do anything and everything. He had no boundaries. Just that there was no one there to um, come up and say that, you know, what you're doing is wrong. Or any, he should have had HR and all of those on his back. But I really should have. I didn't mm. know back then I was 17. So... <clears throat> and I spoke to the person that sent me there because they're friends. It wasn't yeah. a apprenticeship, but she sent it. She sent me there because they knew each other. He needed like some apprentices because he didn't want to pay more money, right? And I told her what he said to me. I said everything he does, and yeah. she said, "Oh, oh, too bad," kind of thing, and didn't do anything about it. Oh, I think I remember you telling me about this. Yeah, then she she didn't yeah. do a single thing, and she still sent people there, doesn't she? But it is, you do get a lot of self-serving people who will just say, oh, there's no head off my back, it's okay, it's just, if that person didn't work out, let's send another one. It, yeah. But you did the the great thing that you weren't comfortable in a position that you were there, he was being extremely inappropriate and you left rather than put up with this, so that's... It, it, you know, it takes people years to figure that out and you've done it... You know, you've got to look after yourself. 100%. And I, sometimes, under pressure, I really can't take information. And there's nothing I can do about it. Hmm. I need someone to, I need a calm environment and someone to tell me a couple of times what to do before I understand it. Yeah. And every, and I was, every time I would ask him a question more than once, he would get so mad at me. Like, seriously mad at me. No, and you should have understood, especially with your age at that time, you were quite young, you were only 17, is that if you're expecting someone to come in an apprenticeship, you wouldn't have had that work experience that a lot of older people would have had. So understanding those tasks take time. You know what? Some people just get into roles that they don't even deserve to be in. The karma is going to come for them one day. Not my place. So, on to this yes. one. <laughs> We're going to go to uh, lack of recourse for poor performance. So, when you're doing poor performance, no one is actually even um, looking at you. They're not even bothered if you're doing, like, um, a tiny bit of work or your performance isn't that great or, you know, so you're like, oh, I'm not being told off for this, so I'm just going to carry on doing all this minimum that I can do. No one's even bothered as long as I get these numbers crunched or whatever. They don't care if I only do a quarter of the work that I normally used to do. So that's you demotivate yourself in that way. And now on to the nice parts, factors that actually motivate people. So when you've got your own economic interests and they match the company's performance, so you've got a, a company that you're going into work in and your interests and their performance interests actually match together. So you're like, yeah, this is a place that I can actually go in and I can actually um, get a um, really good uh, salary out of, I can progress in all over here and I've got good promotion opportunities over here. So when you're taking an interest in the future, a genuine interest in the future path of an employee's career, so if you actually have a team under you and you actually start to take an interest into what they're doing and, you know, you're mentoring them, you're coaching them, you're giving them, you know, lots of training, you're helping them with their coursework if they're studying, they're going to be extremely motivated. 
I remember, and this was in a place, it was in a primary school that I was working in at the time. I started off as a teaching assistant and I decided I wanted to come into teaching. And um, I remember I was doing these courses and there was, for my teaching qualification, I needed to be observed. So I went and I spoke to the head of the year whose classroom I actually worked in as well. And I said to her, I said, oh, um, I would need to get a teaching observation done but because um, they've asked if the school can do it because um, there was quite a distance away. And she turned around and said to me, you know, Asha, there's more people that are more important than you here. I've got this, that and the other. Shouldn't make everything wow. about yourself. So <laughs> that is the reason once I finished my qualifications, uh, then uh, I was like, no, I'm not going to work here anymore. Oh, I, you know, and it does, if you've got somebody who's being quite crass with you or, and to be honest, I've got a very good work ethic. When I go in, I do give it my all. I, I don't, you know, lack off. I don't faff about. I'm like, I'm here to work. This is what I'm going to do. So that was really uh, an eye opener for me. It's like, no matter how hard you work, sometimes you're going to come up with bullish answers. Yeah. Even <laughs> no matter how old you are. So it is true. If you take a genuine interest, if you uh, come across somebody in your future who wants to do something and you give them a, a genuine interest and actually try and help them, believe me, you're probably going to get them to stay with you for so long. It's um, It turns into loyalty. Yeah. Then you've got take a genuine interest in their work-life balance. So if you actually do, again, same thing as at the top. So take a genuine interest in their work-life. You know, um, my boss, I find this fantastic, and I, I love the way that he's let me do my work-life balance because if I was to do a full-time schedule going into an office, I wouldn't be able to do it. But he has given me the uh, option that I can work from home so I can still go and pick up my children. And they've all got different start times and finish times. I can still go and uh, take them to activities and things because I have a fantastic work-life balance. You know, touch wood, it carries on that way. <laughs> but, you know, it's nice that I've had that flexibility that I can do these type of things. So if I've got a doctor's appointment, I know that I can take off half an hour and then just maybe work a half hour extra in the evening instead. So, you know, if you've got someone that you want to hire and they've got family commitments, you know, just being slightly flexible, letting them come in a few minutes late or leave a few minutes early or make up a couple of hours at home, if possible, then it's a nice thing to be doing. then you've got to listen to them. So actually, you know, listen to what they're saying. Look, listen to their ideas. If they've got any problems, listen to them. They might even just have an issue where they've got their kids are acting up or they've got mortgage problems or, you know, they've got some things that all have to happen all at once. Sometimes you just need someone to come in and talk to, you know, sound off on and, you know, tell them all the things, especially if it's a stranger, someone that's not in your personal life. It's Sometimes it's nice to just go and speak to your manager and say, oh, I've got all these issues. I don't know what to do. And then just get an informal, like a, a um, what do you call it? Where there's, uh, that person hasn't got a, a a say in your life and you just want them to I can't even think of the word now but it's nice to just get a third party yeah third party viewpoint someone who's not involved in you and then again behave the way you so I behave the way with you I want you to behave with me so if I'm going to be rude to you if I'm going to be bad mannered if I'm going to swear at you or push you around then I'm going to expect that you're going to do the same to me but if I want to be mindful and respectful and show gratitude and care and you know show my appreciation then I should actually do that to you if I expect you to do all those things for me I should do that to you as well so respect the way that you want to be respected yeah so that's 3.2 very long 3.2 we're just going to go on to, it was wasn't it <laughs> going to go into three point um three m one which is 
this. So on here, because you've looked at those motivating and demotivating factors, I just want you to actually assess the factors that motivate and demotivate you. So just look back on these different points. So the question is, sorry, assess your own personal motivating and demotivating factors. And this is all about you. So on here, you're just going to go on and look at some factors that motivate you and say, yeah, I do like it when someone takes genuine interest in my uh, career path. And I do like it when someone's giving me flexibility and listening to me. And then you can also say, like, no, um, I don't like it when the management does this, that and the other. It caused, and then you can put an example into it as well about how that manager was the way he was and how it caused you to leave. And that's it for there's no other question besides that, is there? No. So let's 